Good morning, Uncle Church. He is risen. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Let's worship Jesus. Come on.
online welcome it's so good to have you with us this number right here is so that you can get connected with us if you're here in person you can also use this number to text us for prayer but if you want prayer today our prayer team will be right next to the stage at the end of service in the seat backs you'll notice we have our prayer and praise card our tithe envelope and the card the card is your one-stop shopping requesting more information to inquire about serving or to get you involved in a connect group once you fill it out, you can either drop it in the offering bucket at the end of service or walk it out to the Connect Center. I want to invite you to attend our Discover More class. It is held the first two Sundays of each month in our office building during our 915 service. It takes you through who we are and the vision that God has given to us for this community, as well as equips you to better understand your specific design and is also a requirement to serve on our dream team. If you have Keiki who are completing kinder through fourth grade this school year, they are eligible to participate in Kids Camp. Kids Camp is happening this summer from July 15th through the 18th. Registration is open and spots are limited, so don't wait too long to sign them up. You can register on our app or come out to the Connect Center if you have questions. All right, that's all we have for announcements. We're glad you're here.
He has risen. Let's give him praise. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the hope of the world. This day is a day like no other. So glad you're with us. Good morning. Happy Easter, everybody. Let me, let me look in the camera and welcome everybody joining us on the courtyard. What an amazing place to do church, experience church. And, of course, I want to welcome all of our online congregation, wherever you might be around the world. Hope you're doing well. Again, good morning. So good. I'm mean, so fired up. So glad to be with you guys because I believe this is a day, of course, if you're a believer in Jesus, this is a day like no other. There never has been, there never will be a day more important than this day. Because everything we believe, everything that we are, every decision we make, the way we live our life, the way we're called by a title, Christian, all is wrapped in what happened this day. And I believe this, this is my deep conviction right now. I don't know if you know this, but we live in a cray, cray, crazy world. Am I the only one? Like this is like next level crazy, and it gets crazier every day. Do I get an amen? amen. And I believe this, and, and this is why Easter is so important, because I believe Easter is a time when God brings his whole church back together to be encouraged and inspired, to live even more powerfully for him, that our faith would grow deeper, that our love would grow crazy, our passion would be strong as ever because God is asking us, the family of God, to live our faith out loud in a hurting world. He is the hope of the world, and who brings us, who brings this world that hope? We do. Through the power of God working in us. Now, if you've been around here any time, you know that I'm a bit of a sports fanatic, and then some. And it's amazing to me uh, so many athletes today, so many powerful athletes with incredible, incredible influence. They'll come up and the reporter will put a microphone in their face and say, hey, tell me about the game today. And they, would, and they start right now boldly going, yeah, I know you want to talk about that game, but I want to talk about my Savior. So many people today who have a microphone and, and, and have influence that are strong Christians are living their faith out loud. Now, I'm sure that most of us in this room will not have that camera in our face or that microphone. But I want you to know, equally as important is that the world around you, because of what Jesus has done in you and through you and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, him calling us to himself, I believe like never before that we would grow deeper, deeper in our passion for him and live that out loud. And it's my conviction that no one in your orbit could possibly not know that you are a devout follower of Jesus. Do I get an amen? amen? So here we are on this Easter resurrection day. So in the word, I want to bring you the word today. In all four gospels, of course, the resurrection and the, and the, and the events of Holy Week are in there. But I want to bring you, if you got your Bibles, I'd love it if you brought your Bible. That'd be amazing. Or your phone, turn it on and turn to John 20. John 20. In the Word of God, the reason I loved John, and there's other great passages, and Matthew did an amazing uh, perspective of this moment that we're about to read. But in John, I love John because you're, you're, you're reading it from a person who is not only an eyewitness, but even in the Word we're going to see in the account in John 20 that he was Jesus' best friend. So when you, it's like if your best friend wrote a story about you, they would be writing a story about an intimate you. They would know everything about you. And that's what you're getting when you're reading John. Now, if you're new to church today, and welcome, if you've never been on the campus, I love having you here. I'm Pastor Rob. Uh, great to have you. But when, if, you're, if you're just trying to find and searching for the truth and wondering, is this God that we're worshiping today real? And can I, can I read this, or is it just a bunch of words on paper? I want you to know, when you read the Word of God, starting in the, very, in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, you're reading Moses' first-hand account of the events of history, and all through the prophets, and all through the Old Testament. Then we get to the New Testament, the apostles who was walking with Jesus. You're getting their account, and Paul, farther into the uh, New Testament, and he, his personal view. So what you're getting is an accurate account of history. 
This is an accurate account of what is going on in the world in Jesus. So let's, if you have, now I've given you some time to get there. I hope you're at, in John 20. We're going to read this story. It's an amazing story that John writes. And it says this about the resurrection day. It says, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. And she ran to find Simon Peter and the other apostle, the other disciple, to whom Jesus loved. There he describes himself. And then it says this. She said to them, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple uh, started out for the tomb. And they are both running. But the other, apostle, the other disciple ran, uh, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Freeze frame a second. So John could have wrote anything in this most important day in world history. But, and he's humble. He doesn't mention his name in, the, in, in, in his writings. But he couldn't pass up this opportunity to tell the world for generations to come, I smoked that dude. Like, I outrun. Anybody ever been in a race? No one gets in a race that doesn't try to win it. And literally, John's going, I won. In verse 5, it says that this is what John got there. And he stooped down, looked inside, and saw the linen wrapping there. But he didn't go inside. Then Simon Peter arrived. He went inside. And he also noticed that the linen wrappings were lying there. And the cloth that was covering Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw that something powerful happened right then when he saw what was going on there. God opened John's eyes to the reality that he was the Messiah and Savior. Because it says right there, I believed. And not until then did they truly understand the scriptures that said, Jesus must rise from the dead and then they went home. But here's the story about Mary. Mary was standing there outside the tomb crying. And as she was weeping, she stopped and looked. And she saw two white-robed angels sitting, one at the head and the other at the foot of the place where Jesus' body was laying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angel asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know what they have done, what they put him. I don't know where they put him. She turned to leave, and she saw someone standing there, and it was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, Jesus said, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And she thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where have you put him, and I will go and get him. And then something powerful happened. Jesus called Mary by name. It says, Mary, Jesus said. And then she turned to ride around and said, Rab- Rabboni, which in Hebrew means teacher. Jesus said, don't cling to me, for I have not ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them that I'm going to send to the Father, your Father, and to your God, and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene found his disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And she gave him this message. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. They were literally locked up because they were, afraid, they were afraid that their fate would have matched Jesus' fate. They still didn't know that Jesus was a savior. But they're about to find out in a powerful way. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds of his hands and his side. And they were filled with joy when they, when they saw him, saw the Lord. Again, they said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then, and here's the powerful moment in this story. He breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When that happened, they understood that Jesus was Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Do I get an amen? Amen. Again, if you're new to the Bible and you're sitting here wondering, can I believe what I just read? Can I believe it? I'm here to say you absolutely can. In in Romans 10.9, it says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that the Father raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. So there is belief needed to understand 
and, and be saved. You must believe that Jesus ro- rose from the dead. But our faith is not built on blind faith. It's built on evidence from eyewitnesses' accounts. So our faith is rooted in truth, that Jesus did resurrect from the dead over 2,000 years ago, and that everything we are, in fact, that resurrection day is the foundation for everything that we are, the way we live our life, the way we handle relationships, the the way we handle the vision for our life, the, the the way we handle a purpose for our life are all rooted and wrapped in that one moment, the resurrection of Jesus. We literally build our life on the fact that he rose from the dead. Do I get an amen? Amen. Throughout centuries, centuries, scores of people have tried to disprove the resurrection because they knew if they could disprove the resurrection, they could disprove Christianity, and that's what they've set out to do for centuries. Many years ago, I read a, a, a book by Simon Greenlip. He was the founder... This is back a long time ago in the late 1700s. He was the founder of Harvard Law School, an attorney. And somebody from his family, it doesn't say, came to know the Lord powerfully. And it riled him. And he didn't like it one bit. So he says to himself, I'm I'm an investigator. I'm a good attorney. I'm going to disprove the Bible. And in all of the work and all of the discovery that he was trying to disprove the Bible, only to become one of the strongest evangelists for Jesus in that time period. A powerful voice for God. Many people through the years have tried to disprove the resurrection, and by all of the accounts, almost all of them have come to know Jesus. That's powerful. But I think the most important thing is this. Hear me. In the story we just read in John 20, it got to that part where Jesus and Mary had an encounter. And Jesus called Mary by name. And at that point, she instantly believed. The vast majority of the people in this room, at some point in your walk, in your journey in life, you had a collision with God. And he called you by name. And I believe this. The farther we get away from that epicenter of that faith, the farther we get away, the enemy is always trying to minimize that moment. And I'm here to say that we can never forget the moment that Jesus and his spirit collided with your spirit and changed your world completely. Because only God can transform the world. Only God. I love that song that we sing. What a beautiful name it is. Jesus. As believers in Jesus, any believers in Jesus in this room besides me? As believers in Jesus, the word says that you have the authority and the ability to pray anything in the name of Jesus. You have power in the name of Jesus. In my life, some of you know this story, but many of you probably don't. Maybe 40 plus years ago, We had a a brand new baby. Elizabeth was one years old. And my wife and I, we didn't even want to be in the same room together at all. Like, we were committed to getting divorced. We were just trying to figure out how to do that. And, and understand all those things. That, so we, we had worked towards getting an attorney. We, we, we were way down the road of getting a divorce. And all of a sudden, a friend of ours invited us to dinner. That was what it was framed. I want to take you to dinner. I said, sure, let's go to dinner. Oh, yeah, we're, we're also going to go to a concert afterwards. So we go to the Ala Moana con, uh, Hotel in the big ballroom. Place is packed with people. The worship music was playing. I had no idea what I was in for. None. Zero. I walked in the room. There's a billion people in it. We're about two rows from the back wall of, it, of, this, of this room. And all of a sudden, this pastor, Pastor Greg Laurie, starts talking. And although there's thousands of people in that room, I thought I was the only one in the room. And he was talking directly to me. And what I realized was Jesus was calling my name to come to know him. And as soon as he was done talking, and he says, hey, if you want to know this Jesus I was just talking about, you come to the front of the room. And I'm a little competitive. So I figured, well, there might be a prize for getting there fastest. (laughs) 
And so everybody was walking out of the aisles. I was like a, a, a halfback, run, running back, just trying to weave through all the people. So I got front. But when I got there, all of a sudden, something came over me, and I couldn't stop crying. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, my wife grabbed my hand, and we were both crying. And I can tell you, the transforming power of Jesus came into our marriage and healed us right then. When Jesus called our name and healed us. In this room, I'm looking through this room, and I see many people that I know. I know your stories. And you, too, have come into contact with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and he has transformed your life from what it was into what it is today. And he's always going to be working. He's always going to be wanting to, you to experience more and more of him. And as we do, our faith grows. But we can never lose sight of that epicenter when Jesus called us by name. When you truly understand, when you truly understand that Jesus lovingly and carefully created you, just who you were. You were perfect in his eyes. And who did he create you for? Himself. He created you for himself. He wanted to spend the rest of his life in a relationship with you. That's why he called you by name. And he wants to be intimately involved in every part of your life. Every part. Now you might be looking at me right now and thinking, oh man, God doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to be part of my life. He, what have I done? No way. He couldn't possibly love me. There's no way. Well, I can tell you what he did on the cross that Good Friday. He went to that cross to take your sins and put them on that cross. And you need to know if that's what you're thinking, that I, God could never love me. God couldn't love you more than he does right now. Because he forgave your past, your present, and your future sins. And one only way he sees you, and we're all sinners. Every one in this room, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one in this room is perfect in any way. But he sees us that way. Isn't that amazing? Because of the resurrection power that came over us when he called us by name. Let me show you in the word. In Ephesians, the four, first chapter, it says this. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. What? It gave him great pleasure. That is mind-boggling to me when you really look at that scripture. But can we get real here? Can we be honest with one another? As lovers of Jesus in this room? As truly chosen children of his? Do we still find great pleasure in our relationship with him? Is our passion for him equal to his passion for us? Do we pursue him as he pursues us? Is his, our desire to be with him the same level of desire that God has for us? And I'm saying to you on this day, Anchor Family, and I believe this, the Lord has given me, downloaded this message to all of us, that he wants us to pursue him like never before. Our theme for the year here at Anchor, if you've just joined us, we have a theme for the year, and, and this is a theme that God gave us, and it's found in Joshua 1.9, and it's a command. It's like, do it, do it. Any folks from the military community in, in the room today? So, so if your superior officer came to you and gave you a command and you said, yeah, I'm not feeling that today. No, I don't think so. Tomorrow's not looking good either. I'll get back to you on that when I want to do with that. What happens to you? Not a good day. And God is saying to us in Joshua 9, I command you. Not if you get around to it. Not if you're feeling like it. I command you to be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For I am with you wherever you go. How many know that today in the world we live in today, it's very easy to get discouraged and fearful? Anybody with me? And God just said in his world, in a world that's turned their back on him, and at every time 
as us Christians, who have Jesus inside of us, the Holy Spirit inside of us, when things happen around us and it, and it bothers us, it's because our values for Jesus and the culture values are colliding there. And we can get fearful, we can get discouraged, and we can get mad. And God's saying, nope, I command you to be strong and courageous. Now again, this strength and courage is not something you can muster up on your own. No matter how hard you try, there's not enough courage in you, not enough strength in you to do what God is saying. Because to do what God is saying, you need him in you. Do you understand that? And with him in you and you allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to work in you and through you, you have the strength and the courage because he will never leave you or forsake you. Do I get an amen? It's super important to understand that. And I, this is my conviction about Easter. My conviction. Easter is about heaven. Because God's ultimate plan for all of us who call ourselves Christians, believers in Jesus, his ultimate plan for every single one of us is to be in heaven for eternity with him. John 16, 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have, should have eternal life. It's his Desire, his passion, everything in the world, world, word leads to this moment that we would spend eternity with him. Heaven is about Easter. But God knew that between now and then, we're going to have to live in this world. And as a dearly loved child of the king, God says, I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit so that I can be with you that I can guide you and comfort you and be with you, to love on you when you need it the most, to encourage you when you need it the most, and sometimes correct you when you need it the most. But I am sending you my Holy Spirit. It's an incredible gift. I've entitled this message Shocking Love because the gifts that God gives us are shocking if we really understand it. And the reason I use the word shocking is because it's really beyond our ability as a human being to totally get our minds around it. But here's the word of God. This is the word of God. So you have to take this as to, the, to realize this is exactly what God would want us to know about him. And it's in John 14. It says this, and I will ask, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. I will ask the Father and he will give you an advocate. Now that's not a word we use much these days. But in the original Greek language of which this was written, the word advocate means paraclete. And what it means in the Greek language, in the original writings, is he's going to send us someone to come alongside us and to do life together. Remember what I just said a little bit ago in Joshua 1, 9, that he, will be, that he is with us wherever we go? Did you hear what he said? He sent his Holy Spirit in us so that he, we know that he's with us wherever we go. The question is, do we actually believe that? Do we believe it? Do we say it? Intellectually, you might think it. But do we believe it here that it's literally guiding our life? That when we need him the most, we don't run for our own thoughts. We don't run for our own conclusions in life. But we run from him for answers. For it says that he gave us an advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because they're not looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. How many know that? How many watch the news and that verse just came live, live and well? The world's hostile to God. They don't want anything to do with them. But here's what it says. But for us, but for, for, for you who know him, you know him because he lives in you. That's incredible to me. No matter what situation you're going through, no matter what problem is over your skis, over your head right now, that you see no light at the end of the tunnel, no matter if you're discouraged, maybe fear is a cloud that's always over you, or depression, or stress, or worry is a constant companion. I am here to tell you, don't let it be. Do not. Because I just read the word of God, and God says, I am with you. I got you. We're going to walk this out together. Just trust me. Do I get an amen? amen? Here's the deal, though. We're humans. We're used to doing our thing our way. And we're more like, I'm driving my own car here of life. I'll let you know when I need you, God. And God is saying to us today, Anchor family, on this resurrection day, to trust him with every 
thing you have without borders or boundaries. Do not let anything. The enemy is always going to try to throw doubt in your mind, always. It's an ever-present whisper. Understand that the enemy is trying to lie to you. He is the father of lies. He'll lie to you every moment to cause doubt and discouragement in your life. Don't let him have any room because all you need to do is trust God with your life. Trust him. Because he has given you power, more power than you can possibly imagine to co- overcome anything the world or the enemy has to throw at you. And let me show you in the word. This is an incredible verse. Again, shocking love. So I agree. We'll have to agree. We totally don't get it. But I can't. You, just because we don't get it doesn't mean it's not true because it's in the word of God. In, in, in uh, Ephesians 1 and it's a prayer Paul is praying over, over the believers. And it says this, I also pray that you'll understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. Just in case you were thinking about, hmm, what's for lunch today? And when is this guy going to get stopped talking? Let me reread that in case that went right by you. This is, this is the word of God. I also pray, Paul writes, that you'll understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power, and this one is over our heads. This is the same power available to us that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in a place of honor at God's right hand. Whoa. That we have the power through the Holy Spirit in us, the same mighty power And by the way, the word power, most of you know if you've been around here any length of time and you study the Bible, is the word dunamis, which means that we get our word dynamite from, which means that we have the ability. In Jesus' name and by the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, we have explosive power to change any circumstances that come our way if we just believe it and invoke the name of Jesus. Do you you hear me? Last night, on the courtyard, this girl comes up to me. She's in her late 20s. And she goes, I need, I need to talk to you, Pastor, about this verse. When she was in college, I think she said she was 21. And the, the love of her life, the whole, her whole future was written in her mind that she was going to get married to her boyfriend and live happily ever after. And out of the blue, she left him for somebody else. And it devastated her. At the very same time, she got in a fight with her mom. And her mom cut her off. She would not return her calls. And this girl hit rock bottom, she says. I was absolutely done with life. I wanted to end this pain. I wanted to get this pain out of my heart. I couldn't live any longer under this pain. So she was planning, and she said, I planned very well to figure out a time and a place that I would take my life. And then in the middle of that, you know, thinking about that, yeah, thinking about that, you know what I'm trying to say, contemplating that, all of a sudden she was walking down the street and she walked right past a church that was praising God in the evening service. And she wondered what's going on in there. She was drawn in. She was literally drawn. She goes, I couldn't stop myself. I I walked into that building. And that night, Jesus called me by name, and I experienced the resurrection power of Jesus in that moment when that congregation prayed over me, or that person prayed over me. It changed everything in her life. And then she pointed at her husband and her two kids. Blew her mind. Blew her mind. God has the power to resurrect in my life, I told you the story of my marriage. Would you throw that picture up for me, would you? This is my family. This is my kids and my, their spouses and my grandkids. Can I just say that that picture you're looking at is a miracle? Because if Jesus' resurrection power didn't come and heal my marriage, that picture never would have happened, ever. But it did. Because God is gracious. And he's calling all of us by name. He's pursuing you every day to follow him and trust him with your life. Amen? Trust him. Don't let a day go by that you don't wake up in the morning, Lord, you and me today, like grab his hand. This is what I do. I always grab, 
make a fist. I said, okay, you and me, God, today. It's you and me. Let's go. Let's go do this. I've invited him in to every aspect of my life, and I'm asking you to do the same thing and watch what happens in your life. Imagine this resurrection power and a friend of yours, a family member, a coworker, a neighbor was going through something incredible in their life, something devastating, and you could have the courage and the strength and the courage to walk up to that person out of the blue and go, hey, I can't fix this, but I know the one who can. Would you let me pray for you? Maybe something going on in your life. You have that same ability. Pray, pray in the name of Jesus that the power of God would come over you and take care of that issue. Are you hearing me? And as amazing as that Holy Spirit is, an amazing gift, I believe the greatest gift that we could ever receive as believers in Jesus is heaven. I believe that. In the word, over and over, 500 times, it leads the believer to know that this is not our home. Heaven is our home. This is not at all. In fact, in the word, it says we're not citizens of this earth. We're citizens of heaven. And I believe Easter is about heaven because that is our ultimate reward. It's an amazing reward. Here's the problem. We rarely, if ever, think about heaven. We're racing through life, and we're thinking, oh, well, I hope something's at the end of the, end of the trail. But I got too much going on right now. I'll just cross my fingers and hope. Whatever happens, happens. Many believers believe that. Anybody love to travel in here? Anybody besides me? I love traveling. And half the fun of traveling is planning the event. You're looking at where you're going. You're looking at how you were, what the weather's like. You're looking at what the restaurants are around there. You're looking at what to do. That's, that's half the fun of, of traveling. Do I get an amen? God is not trying to keep heaven from us. In the Word, in, in a few months, we'll go, we'll go deeper into this. And there's also sermons online right now that you go back to. The way we went in de- depth in heaven. Heaven is not a place that... It's not what Hollywood says. It's not a place where we're going to float around in the clouds and spirits and play harps. Not in any way. I would find that not very good. But the reality is, heaven is a real place. In fact, in the Word, I can't get deep into it today, but in the Word, in Revelation 21... It says, the, the, John the Apostle in a vision said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I wonder why they use the word earth there. Why would God say earth? It's very simple. Because we know earth. We're living on earth right now. And it is a phenomenal place. Except the new heaven is going to be without any pain, or sorrow, or disease, worry, any of that. We're going to live in the beauty of what God actually intended it to be. A friend of mine, I told you last week, just, was, I was devastated, but when I came to the realization that, wait, Dr. Earl, my, my buddy Dr. Earl, who I, I literally played golf every Friday with for 37 years. We did life together. We grew up our families together. I mean, this guy was, him and I were tight. And then suddenly, out of the blue, he passed away. And after I realized and started praising God that he allowed Earl in my life, then I realized something even more powerful. I said, wait, 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 wait. Earl is exactly where he wants to be because literally he's home. He's home. Heaven is our home. When you truly believe that, it should redefine your worst day. Your worst day. When you realize we're only, the word even says, we're only here for 60, 70, 80 years. It's short. Life is short. Life flies by. But when we get to eternity, it's forever. And I want you to know, if you can just imagine this with me, heaven is going to be the most restful, the most beautiful place you could possibly imagine. But it's a real place. Our last breath on earth, our spirit is in heaven. The word even says that we'll have new bodies. The the beauty, the essence of who God originally created you to be will not change. I believe this, and I'll tell you why in a second, but I believe this. When we get to heaven, 
we'll be exactly who we are, but without sin or pain or disease or worry or stress. What the real creation that God's finger puts are all over us, that's who's going to come to fruition. That's who's going to come to be who, you're going to be the, uh, the, the beauty of who God intentionally, intentionally initially intended you to be. Now, I've done a lot of study in heaven, way more than I probably should have. I spent a lot of time. And some of the time, some of the books I read were on near-death experiences. Now, some theologians discount some, but they have theologians that believe that these are some of the people that have told their story because God allowed them to see a glimpse of heaven so they would come back and report to us so that we never take our eyes off heaven. And one of the stories that just touched me deeply is in the book Driven by Eternity by John Bevere. I read that book way before I met John. I loved that book. And then out of the blue, I got to meet him. And then we started playing golf together. So on one of the golf outings, when he came to Hawaii, I went golfing with him. And I said, you know the story about that boy that got electrocuted in that book? Like, is that for real? Like, is that really? I mean, I mean... You spent quite a bit of time talking about that. Is, is that real? And he goes, oh, Rob, you have no idea. I can only tell a little bit. You can write a whole book about what happened. See, this boy got electrocuted, and he was in a coma for many months. And then he woke up from this coma. They, he, would, they, he was pronounced dead. But there was a, still a heartbeat, so they put him on a vent, and, they, and he let, put him in an induced coma. And out of the blue, he came back to life six months later. And he's sitting at his parents at the, at the uh, breakfast table at breakfast after he got it out of the hospital and he was, he was there with the, with the family. And then he looked at his mom and says, hey, I met my sister. And the mom froze. What do you mean you met my sister? Yeah, I, I didn't know I had a sister. Well, that sister was stillborn. He never knew his sister. They never talked about it. Then he talked about other people he met because heaven is a very relational place. That's why it's so important that we don't allow anyone in our orbit not to know Jesus because we want them to be spending eternity with us. But in this story, in this story, he talked about how beautiful, peaceful, and loving heaven was. And he told his dad, if I ever die again, don't pray me back. Just wait until you come and get me. I will meet you there. Many people, many, and it's an amazing book if you want more about this information. It's, a, it's an amazing book called Imagine heaven a ma amazing book of uh, just tells stories after story but heaven is a real place and Easter leads us to heaven children of the king don't let yourself be fooled heaven is going to be glorious and do not take your eyes off the prize at the end do not be afraid to die do not there's people in my life right now that are gotten a little older. I mean, you know, some of you right now are going, of course, buddy, you're, you're talking about heaven. You're halfway in the grave. I get that. I get that. I mean, many of us in, are young. I got a whole life to live. I'll worry about that at the end. And God said it in his word. Keep your eyes on me in heaven. Keep your eyes on me in heaven. Do I get an amen? Let's pray together. Lord. On this resurrection day, Lord, as we celebrate the most powerful day in the history of humanity, we're honored that you called us, chose us, adopted us to be your kids. We are in awe of that. Thank you, Lord, for calling us by name so that we can know you and love you and that we can receive your love back by the power of the Holy Spirit. So this day, Lord, we're here in awe of you. We thank you, Lord. And I want to pray for anyone in this room that's never come to a place in your journey in life that you've invited Jesus into your story. Because I want you to know on this Easter 2024, God is extending an invitation to you to know Him and to experience the love only He can bring. Only He can. He can he's the only one that can bring peace of mind and heart this day. And if you've never come to that place, looking online or joining us on the courtyard right now or in this room right now, you never have. The word again in Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare that Jesus is Lord, and how we do it here at Anchor, what, you got your heads bowed, but it, I want you to declare it, and here's how we do it here. 
If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what a day to do it. All I want you to do is slip your hand up right now so I know who I'm praying with. Yep, I see you all. Oh, you guys, raise your hands high. I see your hands going up all over the room. Oh, my gosh. This is amazing. All over the room. Hitchhike off my prayer. Lord, this day, I believe you are calling me by my name. Thank you, Lord, for choosing me. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit in me to love me. Lord, I pray your blessing on these folks to raise their hand, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit so they tangibly feel your embrace. In Jesus' name. We all said? Paul, my dear friend sitting in this front row, got his tux on. How many years ago? 13 years ago, today, he got saved. He accepted Jesus' invitation. All of you who accepted the invitation, let Jesus all the way in, and your life will never be the same. Right, Paul? Thank you, Pastor Rob. Can we give it up for our lead pastor? Thank you for bringing the word this morning. Your birthday suit. Yeah, the, the real one, the spiritual birthday suit, not the one underneath. I just want to say congratulations for those that said yes to Jesus, that accepted that invitation, the same one that Paul did. And I want to invite you to attend our Discover More classes the first two Sundays during this service in our office building. It's the last building on the right. And we, we want to invite you to just connect with us right out the doors of this place called the Connect Center. We'd love to give you some next steps, a Bible, answer any questions, or just talk story with you if you guys have any questions or want to, want to say some stuff. Um, and actually, I see some new faces here this morning. And I see some people that have probably, you know, been attending like a while ago and you're coming back. And I just want to thank you for celebrating Easter with us. It's so good that you're here. And I want to invite you back next week because next week we're actually going to be starting a new series that has to do with our vision, the, the vision that God has given this church at this time. And we'd love to have you there. And for those that call Anchor their home, and I just want to say thank you for entrusting God with your, your finances, your tithes and offerings. Thank you so much. Because when you do that and you're trusting God and believing in the mission and vision of Anchor Church, what you're doing is fueling the gospel to be spread around the island and across the globe. So thank you so much for that. And here's some ways that we can interact if the Lord is calling you to give. You can give through our church app, you can give through the envelopes, or you can give online. But let's pray and ask God to bless us as we worship. Lord, thank you so much. You've given us everything, Lord, everything that Pastor Rob said this morning about this new life that we have in you, Jesus. You defeated the grave. You've given us your Holy Spirit, and there's this gift of heaven that you're waiting for us, Lord. You've given us literally everything. So right now, in this moment of tithes and offerings, Lord, our finances, Lord, we cheerfully give, and we ask that you would bless it, that you would use it to further your kingdom, Jesus, and make you famous everywhere. We love you. In your precious name, we say amen. Amen, amen. Anchor Church, let's stand together and let's worship one more time tonight.